Virgil Morgan and Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday walked into history on October 26th, 1881, when they exchanged gunfire with a group of outlaws in the town of Tombstone in the Arizona Territory. What happened there is fairly well known, but much less well known was the story of the woman who briefly accompanied Doc Holliday at his time there in Tombstone and who may have saved his life earlier in his career. Without her, Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday may not have walked side by side into the most famous gunfight in the history of the Wild West. Mary Catherine Horony, better known as Big Nose Kate, was another larger-than-life colorful character of the Wild West, and hers is a story that deserves to be remembered. Her entire history is shadowy and maybe full of tall tales. Some historians say Kate was born in Hungary, Slovakia in November 1849. Others claim the year was 1850. Kate was one of several children. One story surrounding her family's immigration to Mexico says that her father, Michael Horony, was a personal physician to Maximilian I, the Austro-Hungarian Archduke whom Napoleon III had installed as the Emperor of Mexico. And when the monarch's reign failed, Horony moved his family to Iowa. But there is little evidence to support that claim. Other historians say the family immigrated through New York City, like many others in that era, and wandered west, eventually settling in Iowa. Whatever the truth, Kate's parents died when she was a teenager at 14 or 15 and left her and her siblings without parents in Iowa. Unhappy with her situation, she ran away from the foster home that took her in and stowed away on a riverboat that was traveling down the Mississippi. In later memoirs, Kate claims that she was discovered by the riverboat captain on this trip and was taken under his wing. She began to use his last name, Kate Fisher, and enrolled in a school at a convent in St. Louis. Historians disagree over whether she graduated from the school, but her contemporaries say that she was smart enough to be successful at whatever she chose to do, although opportunities were somewhat limited for women at the time. She claims that in St. Louis she married a man named Silas Melvin and had a child with him, but both he and the child died of an illness. But again, the historical record is unable to prove that claim. But it also appears to be in St. Louis, where she first began working, as a prostitute. It was there, some historians claim, that Kate first met a man named John Henry Holliday, who would go on to fame in the West with the moniker Doc Holliday. Holliday had recently graduated from a dental school in Pennsylvania, but could not yet get a license to practice because he was too young, not yet 21 years of age. Holliday was in St. Louis because a friend, A. Jimison Fuchs Jr., offered Holliday a job in his practice in the interim. Fuchs' office was only a few blocks away from where Kate was plying her trade. Holliday, with his Georgia drawl and legendary manners, was probably quite memorable to Cade, among the other men she entertained. He returned to Georgia in 1872 to open his own dental practice, leaving her behind, plying her trade. After this, historians believe Kate was working as a prostitute in Dodge City, Kansas. We know Kate changed locations because there is documentation showing she was fined in Dodge City for being a sporting woman, which was what officials called prostitution at the time. She was working at a brothel owned by Nellie Earp, the wife of James Earp, who was one of the lesser-known Earp brothers. Throughout her busy life, Kate was known by many nicknames because of her marriages and reputation of moving from place to place. In addition to Big Nose, she was also known as Katie Elder, Mrs. John H. Doc Holliday, Nosy Kate, Kate Cummings, and Kate Melvin. The nickname Big Nose Kate was actually used by Wyatt Earp in an article he wrote for a San Francisco newspaper in 1896. Earp wrote that this wasn't a comment on her actual nose, but referred to her strong, bold character. He said she had a legendary temper and valued her freedom over most anything else. Despite numerous film depictions to the contrary, Kate wasn't particularly fond of Earp, and the feeling was reciprocated. She was not a blushing violet and never apologetic for her profession or her hard-drinking ways. The men around Kate may not have appreciated the way she didn't ask for permission to live the way she wanted to. They may also have been intimidated by her intelligence, which Holliday was known to have said was equal to his own. In the 1870s, Kate was living with J.S. Elder, a saloon keeper in Wichita, who gave her the surname made famous in the 1965 Western film The Sons of Katie Elder, starring John Wayne and Dean Martin. She was arrested for prostitution in June of that year, and that brush with the law may have encouraged her to move somewhere more friendly to her profession. Kate went upstream from Dodge City to Great Bend, and her protector, J.S. Elder, went elsewhere. Unfortunately, trouble found her again in Great Bend, and Kate was fined $10 for assault and battery. She found another man to protect her, a saloon owner, gambler, and gunslinger named Tom Sherman, a man with a fearsome reputation. Sherman wasn't someone to mess around with. According to one story, after shooting a man in a gunfight, Sherman said to the people watching, 
I'd better shoot him again, hadn't I, boys? And he did, walking up to point blank range to do so. Kate and Sherman wandered the West, going from town to town, seeking opportunities for both prostitute and gambler. She was working in Fort Griffith, Texas, when Doc Holliday blew into her life again. In the time since she had known him in St. Louis, Holliday had been shot in the leg and now walked with a limp. He had also picked up what people at the time called lung disease or consumption. Doctors today call it tuberculosis. It would eventually kill him, but in the meantime, Holliday went west, seeking the drier climates that were believed to help those with his condition. Along the way, he was developing his own reputation for violence, and no patience for those he felt were shortchanging him. In addition to reuniting with Cade, it was at Fort Griffin that Holliday met Wyatt Earp, then a deputy U.S. Marshal was on the trail of the notorious outlaw, Dirty Dave Rudabaugh. Holliday had played cards with Rudabaugh and described him as an ignorant scoundrel. It is entirely possible that Wyatt and Doc Holliday were introduced by Kate, who was probably already familiar with Earp, having worked at James Earp's saloon earlier in her career. Later, Earp told a story about what happened in Fort Griffin, which Kate said he embellished, but which actually showed her in a good light. According to Earp, Holliday was playing cards with a notorious gambler named Ed Bailey when things went awry. Bailey, apparently not trusting Holliday to play fairly, was looking through the discard pile after every hand. That was blatantly against the rules of the card game. Holiday asked Bailey to stop, and when he didn't, Holiday raked in the pot, apparently intending to leave. Bailey drew his gun to make Holiday put the money back, but Holiday gutted Bailey with a knife, killing him. The townspeople nabbed Holiday and threw him in jail, rumbling about ropes and murder. Kate jumped to Holiday's rescue by setting a huge fire to attract the town's attention, and then showed up at the jail, toting a gun in both hands, demanding Holiday's release. However the jailbreak happened, Kate and Holiday fled town and were at Dodge City, Kansas shortly thereafter. She claims that they married some time before arriving in Dodge City and they uh, registered at the hotel there under the name Dr. and Mrs. Holiday. But like so many things in Katie's life, there's no evidence to prove that it actually happened. The registration might have been an attempt to lend some legitimacy to their situation. Now together, Holiday continued to work as both a dentist and a gambler, while Kate continued to practice the world's oldest profession. They continued on Western after Holiday was accused of burglarizing a store in Dodge City. His cough was becoming worse. They weren't tied down to any one place for very long. Holiday established a saloon in Las Vegas, New Mexico territory, but the town was already garnering a reputation for violence, so he sold up and the couple moved on. When the Earps encouraged Holiday to move to Tombstone, a rustic silver mining camp in Arizona Territory, Kate lived elsewhere for a time, but joined him before the big shootout for which he is most well remembered. By some account, she may have witnessed the shootout. Their relationship throughout their time together was tempestuous. Once, after a serious argument, Holiday's enemies took advantage of their estrangement and talked Kate into filing a false claim with authorities that Holiday had helped to rob the Benson stagecoach. She had been very drunk at the time that she made the statement, but it was a very serious accusation. Two men had been killed in the holdup. The Earps stepped in and provided witnesses proving Kate's statement false, but the damage to Kate and Holiday's relationship seemed permanent. They were never as close after that time. Things deteriorated further after Town Marshal Virgil Earp arrested Kate for disorderly conduct, and she left town, furious. Holiday died in Colorado in 1887. Kate married again in 1890 to George Cummings, a minor and, according to Kate, abusive alcoholic. They moved to Bisbee, Arizona, and Kate opened a bakery that failed. She divorced Cummings and moved in with Jack Howard, another minor. This final relationship seemed to be a good fit, as Kate put down roots and stayed with Howard for 30 years. Howard left her the home they lived in after his death in 1930. Aging and short of resources, Kate sold the home and applied to Arizona Governor George Hunt, for permission to move into the Arizona Pioneers' home in Prescott. The home had originally been established for aging and infirm men who settled the western frontier. They were also required to be American citizens, which Kate may or may not have been. It took her some time, but she was eventually given permission to move into the home. Kate was the first woman who was granted permission to do so. In her final years, she maintained active letter-writing campaigns to political leaders in an effort to improve the lot of those who lived in the Arizona Pioneers' home. She remained feisty and outspoken to the end, died of heart disease in November of 1940. She's buried at the cemetery at the Arizona Pioneers Home in Prescott, Arizona. While she was at the Arizona Pioneers Home, several authors came to her offering to write her story. At first she was angry because they didn't offer her money, and then she was angry because the story never seemed to get written. But those conversations did tell us something about her relationship with Doc Holliday. She said of him, I loved Doc, thought the world of him, 
and he was always kind to me until he got mixed up with those herbs. One wonders what nickname Big Nose Kate used when she was referring to Wyatt Earp. She said of her life once, part is funny, part is sad, such is life any way you take it. Very reminiscent of a quote about life that Doc Holliday gave when he said there is no normal life, there is only life. And that famous couple represented life in the Wild West. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.